In healthcare, minimally invasive treatment is a welcome buzzword across all fields of practice. It's disarming. I mean, after all, who wants to be uh, maximally invasive in their healthcare practice? So, when it comes to endodontics, a more pertinent question perhaps would be to ask whether the current therapeutic methods that we have available aren't minimally invasive enough and whether a more minimally invasive method is available at the present time that should be implemented instead. Now, in endodontics, the word minimally invasive refers to the minimal removal of dentin during three specific phases of root canal procedure. First, during the coronal axis preparation when you're doing your axis cavity, uh, during the radicular apical preparation when you're cleaning the apex, and last, uh, during the flaring of the roots that uh, then connects this apical preparation to the coronal preparation. Dentin removal is limited for the most part to these specific three phases of instrumentation and uh, preparation during our treatment. Now, uh, since the goal of endodontic therapy is microbial control as we've established in the past, we have to see how this goal can be achieved with minimal dental removal uh, given the available technology that is present now. Now, unfortunately, some level of dentin removal is inevitable as sterilizing the root canal without direct manipulation is just not possible at the present time. The shaping process facilitates irrigation and obturation, and access is required to achieve all three of these things. The real question, however, is where we should draw the line and where should our priorities be? Since the goal of access preparation is to find all canal orifices and allow access for their full disinfection, including those hidden canals that we can't find, um, you know, making the access smaller in order to save a small amount of tooth structure uh, will have the unintended consequence of increasing the rate of procedural errors. Uh, that includes missing canals, ledging, instrument separation, even perforations and therefore being more minimally invasive than the standard microsurgical access preparation, yes, may save some dentin and enamel on the one hand and in the short run, but on the other hand, these gains could be offset through an increase in the rate of procedural errors that can diminish the overall outcome of the case in the long run. Furthermore, histological studies have shown that the natural diameter of roots at the apex require a biologically sound apical preparation size. And these biological sizes combined with effective irrigation uh, improve our odds of clearing the, bi the biofilm and increase our chances of success in the long run. It is therefore this third area of dentin removal, which namely being the root flaring part, that we may at least be able to save some dentin on. Now, Historically, we've flared and removed dentin in this area of the root to accommodate condensers and pluggers for warm vertical and lateral condensation techniques. However, with the increased popularity of bonded obturation using cone matching with sealer-based technology offered through bioceramic cements, the need for overflaring to fit pluggers and spreaders down to the apical one-third of the root may just not be necessary anymore. And this can surely save us some dentin, but not flaring canals beyond a regular O4 taper, which is adequate for irrigation and the implementation of bonded obturation. Now, in conclusion, while we should strive at all time to be minimally invasive during our treatment, only some aspects of minimally invasive endodontics may remain with us in the years to come. Others, such as micro-access preparations uh, that seem to complicate matters, will soon disappear as fads when the negative consequences of their use compared to what they offer in benefits becomes clear to sound-minded clinicians. For Rewald Endo, I'm Ali Nisse, and I hope you found this information helpful.